Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, the director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is cartoonist Keith Knight, creator of the comic strips The K Chronicles and The Nightlife, and the social political single panel comic Think. His art has appeared in various publications, including The New Yorker, The Washington Post, Daily Cause, San Francisco Chronicle, Medium.com, Ebony, ESPN The Magazine, LA Weekly, Mad Magazine, and The Funny Times. Knight was a co-creator, co-writer, and an executive producer on the Hulu streaming series, Woke, which was inspired by his comics and life in San Francisco. Knight and his work have been honored with numerous awards, including the 2022 Master Cartoonist Award at CXC Comic Fest, a 2020 Rose Door for Best International Comedy for Woke, a 2015 NAACP History Maker Award, the Comic-Con Ink Pot Award for Career Achievement in Comics, the Harvey Kurtzman Award for Best Comic Strip for the K Chronicles, as well as several Glyph Awards for Best Comic Strip. On February 7th, 2023, Knight will give a lecture titled The Intersection of Art and Social Justice as the 2022-2023 Colin Rowe Thomas O'Fallon Memorial Lecturer. His talk is part of the Oregon Humanities Center's 2022-2023 themed speaker series on the topic of belonging. Thanks, Keith, for coming on the show. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. It's uh, my pleasure. So first, tell us a little bit about your background, where are you from, and how did you become interested in cartooning? Well, I grew up in Malden, Massachusetts, small working class town north of Boston. Um, and um, it's sort of a place where everyone who works in Boston stays <laughs> and takes the orange line in. And um, I was always just drawing all the time. And I was just encouraged to do it by teachers who would pick up my stuff in kindergarten and go, look at this, look at this. And um, and I just remember going to the library and the two books that my library had cartooning collections was Charles Schultz, Peanuts and uh, Gary Trudeau's Doonesbury. Um, so, um, I just just remember being so attracted to it and looking in the paper, uh, Boston Globe, and finding comics on on the comics page, but also finding them on the editorial page and finding them on the sports page and in the classified. So it made me read the newspaper cover to cover, uh, looking for comics. And what's it's it's for my for Christmas, my big Christmas gift was a. Uh, subscription to the New York Times, the Friday and Sunday paper. Um, and it's just so nice to be like looking through a paper again, <laughs> you know, just because you look at it so much differently than you look at the internet and you look at, you read everything on it and it takes you to places that, uh, that the internet will not take you and, <laughs> and it won't register your information and, and hold it against you. So uh, I really enjoy it, and um, and I, I the reason why I love newspapers to this day is because the comics, looking for comics. So your comics, The K Chronicles and The Nightlife, focus around a character named Keith Knight, and you describe yourself as an autobiographical artist. Why has that approach made sense for you? Because when I, and I, I just really sort of came to this. When I was growing up, all the books that we were assigned in school um, never had anybody that looked like me as the protagonist in it. And we got more books where animals were protagonists more than people of color. So um, I liked to create stories that centered me and my friends as the quote unquote heroes in it. And I didn't, re I didn't think about that until just really recently. But um, yeah, I just felt like just telling my own story because I wasn't seeing my story reflected back to me in any way, shape or form. And so that's sort of really how it developed because, you know, hip hop was in its infancy when we were coming up. And But every time you saw anything about hip hop fans, you're, oh, they're thugs, they're um, gang members, they're this, they're that. And I was like, that's not reflective of anybody that I know. And, you know, if anything, 
if anything, hip hop fans have an appreciation for all types of music because we're looking for these great loops and samples and breaks and stuff. And so I just remember just sitting around in my friend's house and we're like going through his older brother's record collection, which featured Led Zeppelin and taking the breaks and 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 it's just like it was normal for us and you know normal for black folks to have all these different types of music and so I, I just wanted to create something that reflected my reality and that reality is reflective of people all over the place and I think that's uh that's what makes the 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 comic strip have the success of the comic strip just so many people can relate to it so you already started to answer this question but for those who aren't familiar with your work what should we know about the k chronicles <laughs> um it, it's it's just me it's it's as if some guy is sitting next to you in a bar um telling you a story and it's couched in truth you're like but it it always takes a weird turn. You're not really quite sure if it's true or not. But it just reflected some of the great stories that my family members would tell around my great uncle's bar back in the day. And I just remember being a young kid, just sitting around, listening to family members like with their fake British accents and telling these funny, hilarious and I stories. And I just said, I want to do that, but with comics. Um. So you're, you're, one of your other regular comics is the single panel comic Think. Can you give us a sense of the project of that comic and why it made sense to make that a single panel comic? Well, I, I remember early on, I talk about this in my talk, which I was asked by a, a website to come up with another comic strip and they wanted something similar to the K Chronicles, but why do a second K Chronicles? So I want to do something the opposite. The K Chronicles is autobiographical and it's multi-panel. So I wanted to do something out of the news that was single panel because I had all these ideas that I couldn't I couldn't flesh out into longer strips. So I was like, I want to do this single panel. And it's not always single panel. Sometimes it's it's two panels or whatever. Um, so it was just really important for me to do something to challenge myself in a different way. So um, so I came up with Think, this single panel strip. And um, and I, I love sort of the challenge of doing both of them um, and just working in different formats. It's really fun. So as both Think and the K Chronicles make clear, a crucial aspect of your work as a cartoonist is ad advancing social justice. Yeah, advancing social justice and just just showing you that that black people exist. That's that like for me, think I always try, I, I do my best to have like some sort of black character in it all the time. Because when you see your average editorial cartoon, it's, it's a white person. So to me, it's just about making black folks visible um, in, in every way, shape, and form. So, um, and I think we did that also with the show. Um, it was important for us to have uh, different characters and different folks in front of the camera and behind the camera that um, that didn't you didn't usually see. So that was important. And why? What were the what's particularly useful about comics as a medium to do that work in your sense? In your view, so, comics is the ultimate. Like it, it co combines illustration and text, but it's also like the, oh, I think it's the oldest medium. I, I believe cave, cave paintings were comics. I believe hieroglyphics were comics. Um, I believe that a lot of people, it's, it's the first mass media. So a lot of people uh, were, were communicated to through images and text. And, and I just saw this really great exhibit. I just did a, a presentation in Champaign, Urbana, and um, and they had an exhibition with like a Dutch illustrator who was far, far before the first editorial cartoonist was doing these 
these posters that, and he was the first artist that was caricaturing specific monarchs and leaders. And they would, you know, print these up and post them on walls and different places. And the people who could read would read them to folks who couldn't read. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, cartooning is, is, is mass media for the people. And I love the fact that it's, all you need is a pen and a piece of paper. It's like a dollar ten, you know. It's uh, with a with a, a movie or a, a TV show. You need millions of dollars of equipment and tons of people and all this stuff. And I love the fact that I can just go to my hotel room and and open up my notebook and just just do something. So you all, I mentioned, and you mentioned, you've also uh, do you're also doing this work through the mass media of television and the the. Uh, live action streaming series woke on Hulu. So first tell us what led to you developing that show? Where did that come from? Where did the idea for that come from? What made you want to make that leap? Uh, I think the threat of hunger. Um, <laughs> now, like I was in San Francisco leading, leading a very cush, cushy life, but I saw the writing on the wall with technology and the destruction of the alternative weekly market. And that's where my strip was running the most. And um and I, again, I apologize. The sun is now coming <laughs> into my face. But um, I, I just saw that. I was like, there's no way I'm going to have a career if I don't transition somehow, some way. So uh, so we left San Francisco, my wife and I, and we went down to Los Angeles to uh, and with the idea of getting a TV show. And, um, and you know, I just found the cafe, my cafe that I draw in, and uh, was right across the street from Sony. And um, and I just met people, and people saw my work. And I think you know, somebody introduced me to a producer that took interest to in my work, and and I just sort of grew from that. And um, you know, they just saw that I could tell a really good story, and um, so. One thing led to another. This producer had a had a gig with this production company, and um, I I now know why. Whenever you win something, you have to have a list of people to thank because there were like, you know, thirty people that made it all possible. But um, yeah, it was it was pretty amazing, and it's just amazing how many planets have to align to to get things made. It's it's it was a a crazy journey. Tell us about the premise of the show. Well, um, the show is about a cartoonist named Keith Knight. Um, sort of, we differentiated, you know, K-E-E-F and, and my name, Keith. Um, and he's about to break big with a, a very mild comic strip called Toast and Butter. And um, he's sort of this guy who doesn't get political, doesn't do, you know, he's just tries to stay in his lane. And uh, then he has a traumatizing incident with the police and it sort of jars his third eye open. And this eye is basically allowing uh, inanimate objects to start talking to him. And they're sort of preaching to him about gentrification and, uh, and police brutality and um, uh, poisoning the black community with malt liquor and all this different stuff. So he's, sort of taken aback by this and and sort of is trying to so, sort of you know how how to how to deal with this how to how to and also it, it really is it's about ptsd it's about how you know uh black men are supposed to just sort of this uh, are supposed to just take this you know it's it's you're supposed to you you get stopped by the cops all the time and you just brush it off like it's nothing. You know, you're supposed to brush it off like it's nothing. And um, so it's, it really is about that. So you are also a public speaker and an educator on issues of race and racial illiteracy, police brutality, the justice system, media, and the importance of social activism. Why is that an important aspect of what you do? Oh, well, I, I think it's a, it's, why? Because I think it's America's biggest problem is its race problem. And uh, America doesn't want to address it. America feels a, a lot more comfortable sweeping it under the rug. We have politicians whose job it is 
to try to outlaw talking about any of it. And the problem is like black history in this country is American history. This country is built on the backs of millions of enslaved Africans. And I don't think we spend any amount of time sort of taking that in. And that's the question I ask with my my slideshow is, is like, what could you build with centuries of free labor? What could you build? And, and I don't think we really contemplate that. And I, I honestly believe that everything that is going on today is explained through this nation's history. Um, and if we just examine it and truly talk about it, we could sit there and go, okay, now this is why police brutality exists. This is why the disparity between white and black families exists. This is why ghettos exist. This is, you know, there's, there's so much that can be explained just by knowing our history. And, and we do our best not to. And um, the whole premise of our country is like rich whites convincing poor whites, you know, like it's not, it's not us hoarding all this stuff. It's, it's it's these other people taking your stuff, you know, taking your jobs. Taking, and if we know that, if we if we knew that that's what this is, and it, it is not as much uh, is now like it's happening as much now as it did back then, we we would do something about it. And I, well, frankly, that's why I probably would be banned in Florida giving this talk in Florida. <laughs> Um, you're laughing about it now as you tell me that, uh, and you treat these subjects in your work using comedy and humor. What's the benefit of talking about them using comedy and humor? What 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 does that allow? Uh, why does that help to to uh, help educate people on these topics? Well, it's the medicine that makes the you know. I mean, it's the the sweet stuff that makes the medicine go down. That's the humor. And and black tradition is sh like it, it, we would be crying if we weren't laughing. So it's it's a fine line between tragedy and comedy. And so that's super important to to understand that. And I come from a tradition of it. I know like there's nothing that I'm doing that's new. There's nothing that like from comedians like Dick Gregory and, and cartoonists like Ollie Harrington um, have been doing this for years, century, you know, like almost a century before me. So um, it's, it's, I, I'm just continuing on it in a tradition. And, um, and I, you know, I feel like I, I do it better than most people. <laughs> so, uh, um, I, I love speaking to people. Uh, I think becoming a cartoonist is a, both a curse and a blessing because I, it's one of the reasons why I sit and draw in cafes in public because it's such a solitary endeavor that I like the ideas I get are com come from conversations with people. And I say this during my talk, like you will learn more about black history by speaking to, to a black person over 65 for 10 minutes, speak to them for 10 minutes. You'll learn more about black history than you ever learned in any school book, uh, anybody telling you. It's just, um, and you know, I'm getting up there. So pretty soon it, it'll, I'll be the <laughs> doctor. So you call yourself a gentleman cartoonist, why? Uh, you know, it's, it's it, there's an organ tie to that. Um, a fellow cartoonist, um, uh, Shannon Wheeler, he does Too Much Coffee Man. And he used to do this thing called Too Much Coffee Man magazine, a publication. And um, he wanted to run an ad for my work uh, because uh, I contributed to his magazine. And so he took the taste, the most tasteless drawing that I ever did <laughs> at that time. I'm sure there were more tasteless ones, but it's a little kid like pointing over his shoulder to this donkey that has a sign around his neck that says, have a good day. And the kid is going, hey, look at that nice ass. <laughs> and then he put at the bottom, Keith Knight, gentleman cartoonist. 
best. And uh, and when I I just laughed so hard when I saw that and I said, you know what, I'm gonna go by that. And <laughs> so I have Shannon Willow to thank for that. So earlier in our conversation, you you spoke about hip hop music and hip hop doesn't just feature in your comics as a key influence. Tell us about your madcap hip hop punk rock band, The Marginal Prophets. Yeah, it's funny. We're having a resurgence right now, um, partly because some of our music is featured in the show, but also because my nine-year-old keeps on playing, playing in my basement and he's really into it. It's really funny um, to hear it. And I, he kept on saying the same one. So I, I pulled out our live CD and I said, here, listen to this one. And and it was like, he was so excited. Like, oh my goodness, there's more. And um, you know, it's it's fun. It's it, I had I had a band in San Francisco, and uh, we you know we toured around. Uh, uh, we toured all the way up the West Coast, up to Vancouver, and down to San Diego. And I don't know. I think we did we did Wyoming, we did Texas, we did a bunch of different places, and uh, we won a California Music Award. Um, we beat out. Uh, a lot of good people like Ice Cube and E-40 and stuff was sort of our claim to fame. And I shared, we shared uh, a dressing room with Tesla, <laughs> which was really interesting. But um, yeah, it's it was fun. But the last time I played a show, I tore my Achilles. We played a reunion show and I tore my Achilles jumping up and down on stage. So it was a, a grand retirement that... <laughs> But I actually, I do want to play one more show for my nine-year-old. So maybe at some point we're going to play another show. And the music is available on Spotify and Apple Music. I, I don't even, I think it's, yeah, some of it's on Spotify, but not all of it. Like the live album is not. We actually bootlegged ourselves um, <laughs> because this guy kept on saying, if you don't put out a live album, I'm going to bootleg you. And I said, and it, he was a hippie, so we called it. I said, if you do that, I'll kill you. So we called it the dead hippie bootleg. And um, and it's it's uh, I have lots of them and I sell, sell them off my website. Maybe I'll bring some to Eugene. So. Oh, please do. Please do. <laughs> it's it's yeah, really I, good. I, it's, it's a great I, I have, I, I'm old school, but does anybody have CD players anymore? So I have one. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I know, though. The kids are all right. Like, I, I just saw this article about these kids, the, these kids are really embracing this camera from the nineties. Um, I just ha have a, I know there's going to be all this retro stuff. Cause you know, like I, you, you can see it kind of behind me, like right here is a turntable. Um, we, me and my kids built the turntable and, um, I think some of the old media is coming back cause they were interviewing kids and they're like, yeah, technology is just too, like, it's too, it's too much. You can do too much, all the digital stuff. And so they they really like the analog stuff, some of the kids. So I think CDs will come back um in a in a in a bit of a way. But right now I like it because I can just go to my secondhand store and get get like Elvis Costello, best of Elvis Costello for like 50 cents. Yeah, awesome. So tell us about your stint as a Michael Jackson impersonator. <laughs> That was a very long time ago. That was my uh, uh, high school, uh, high school talent show. It was at the height of Thriller. And um, and we were uh, a breakdancing group that, and but I was a terrible breakdancer. I get dizzy, so I, I can't really do anything. Um, but someone, but the finale was, thriller we're going to do thriller and they were looking for a michael jackson impersonator and someone said why don't you do it and i didn't get it because of politics behind the scenes but in order because i'm passive aggressive instead of dressing up in my outfit for the show i dressed up as michael jackson and just did michael jackson moves before the thriller thing and i did it so much better than the other person that at the end, everyone started asking me to go to like do their kid's birthday party and like do fairs and all this stuff. So I suddenly had for one like year, year and a half, I was like making 75 bucks an hour doing Michael Jackson stuff. 
and it was it's probably the most money I, I had ever made in my life <laughs> now that's and not your but, website um, you're going to do a comic based on that experience is that right? I, yeah yeah i'm working on it now i've been working on it for a thousand years but um i just did a a, a chapter about these jackets that came out then that were made of paper and they we drew on them and they were i'm sure it was toxic i'm sure like it leaked into our i'm, I'm sure all the tumors on my back were from the <laughs> jackets but we were that was like people were like oh man wow wow like everyone would ask me to do their jacket and everything and i was like no no you know only only our band members you know only our crew can have the jackets but it was it was pretty funny it, it's fun to reminisce and i just spent I was just back in Boston with all of these guys. And so I don't remember anything. So they tell me these stories and I, I think they're making up half of them, but uh, they're really fun to draw. So um, tell us about your creator sessions. What do you do in them? Oh, my creator sessions are, it's really a Zoom. It's like what we're doing right now, except I just really sort of drop you know, everything I know about either sustaining a career as a creative, um, a 30 year career as a creative, sort of explaining to cartoonists and just really any artist that it's about having different revenue streams and and um, sort of, you know, how I stay creative, how I, where, uh, how I got the show, how I, you know, license stuff or textbooks how i get grants how like just a number of different things and so i spend an afternoon doing that and then i do one that's just about the show and just about everything that goes into a show um from just you know pitching to you know getting an agent or a manager to like how you know, I think the purpose, the the how to write uh, for television, and just a, a number of different things. But it's really fun. It's always a, a a great collective of different folks and different. They're at different points in their careers, and um, it, I learn just as much from them as as they do from me. So it's really fun. And you have a couple of those coming up in February. I see from your website. Yes, yes, I have both the television one and a career as as a creative. So, check and then out. also on your website, people can be your patron. Yes. Oh, yeah, Patreon. Um. So you know, one of the big things that helped me transition from print media to the internet is Patreon. Patreon had just started. Um, and this is one of the main things that I tell people as a creative, like at some point you got to stop. It's great to learn from your, you know, the people that came before you, but also listen to the people that are coming after you. Because I remember a distinct change where it's like, okay, if I'm going to sustain my career, if I'm going to keep a career, I'm going to have to start listening to people a lot younger than me. And I just remember this, this colleague, she, she said, Keith, you know, I think you do really good at this thing called patreon this new thing called patreon and i was like sure why not you know and uh, i just signed up for it and um i didn't really until i saw someone someone else who was like making like nine thousand dollars a month off of it i was like what um but completely different work than what i do like i you know i alienate half you know half the people politically but <laughs> and and this this person has characters having sex so um i think <laughs> that's the way to go um but uh patreon is this great site that allows you to support all types of artists so songwriters video makers poets for all types of writers cartoonists and it's just a wonderful um it's just a great website that has allowed me to sort of make up for all the revenue lost from print media and allowed me to transition to you know long enough to get the show and um and i i remain on patreon uh because it's just a great site uh, like ultimately 
no matter what I do with my career, I'll always continue to do the cartoons because I just think it's a great record of my existence. So when my kids wonder how their dad is so crazy, I just throw them one of my books and said, here, just read that. You'll, you'll get it. You'll understand it. Well, Keith, thank you so much for telling us, uh, helping us to understand why you're so crazy. <laughs> uh, we are really looking forward to seeing you uh, in February at the University of Oregon. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us today. I appreciate it, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. I've been speaking with Keith Knight, the creator of the comic strips The K Chronicles and The Nightlife, and the social political single panel comic called Think. On February 7th, 2023, Knight will give a lecture titled The Intersection of Art and Social Justice as the 2022-23 Colin Rowe Thomas O'Fallon Memorial Lecturer. His talk is part of the Oregon Humanities Center's 2022-23 themed speaker series on the topic of belonging. Thanks so much for watching.